Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti and I want to talk to you today about bacterial transformation. Uh, it's a really cool technique in the lab where we can take uh, foreign DNA and in this case a plasmid and engineer it and transfer it into a, a bacterial cell and get it to do things that it was never able to do before. So genetic recombination using a transformation technique. And so what's interesting, we're going to follow that up with another experiment where we then crack open the bacteria that we've transformed and we're going to try to isolate the protein product from that transformation. We're going to try to purify a single protein that we've um, had the bacteria make for us. And so let's get into that discussion. It's very interesting. And so let's see if I can do this. The screen a little bit larger. So uh, as I mentioned, this is a conversation about bacterial transformation and the protein that we're interested in producing is something called the green fluorescent protein or just GFP. And the way in which we're going to separate that is through a chromatography process. And so first thing I want to just give you is a little background about so what, what gives with this green fluorescent protein. So it turns out that there's a, d a deep water, deep ocean jellyfish that actually uh, produces a green fluorescent protein through bioluminescence. And so it's able to, a lot, you know, it's, it's not too uncommon as it turns out that a lot of organisms in the ocean produce light. Uh, as you can imagine, the ocean's very dark, and so light is a, is a cool thing to be able to harness. And so organisms use it either to defend themselves or to, to attract a prey or something like that. And so bioluminescence What's interesting is uh, scientists have been able to take the DNA out of this particular jellyfish that codes for the protein, green fluorescent protein. So they've been able to remove that. And when they remove it, let me just do this. Let me see if I can draw on top of this. So when they remove the DNA for the gene for the green fluorescent protein, they've then been able to uh, splice it in to a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. So they've been able to create this plasmid and we can use a plasmid as a vector. Meaning that we could use this to then, here it, it's actually been trademarked, it's called P-GLOW. It's kind of a clever name for P for plasmid, GLOW for green fluorescent protein GLOWs. You can actually put that into bacteria. And when this goes into a bacteria, the bacteria are able to produce this green fluorescent protein. It's rather cool, and we're going to do that, so it's going to be neat. And so I thought I'd just overview the protocol very, very quickly, and then I'll get into more detail a little bit later. So we're basically growing some E. coli in a starter plate. So we inoculate and streak some ordinary LB and let it grow overnight. And then we scrape up those colonies uh, of bacteria and we put it into two microcentrifuge tubes. We add some bacteria to this one that says plus p glow, meaning it will have the plasmid and this one is negative p glow, it will not have the plasmid. And then what are we going to do? Just, but just putting a plasmid into a test tube with bacteria doesn't necessarily mean that the bacteria are going to take it in. And so what we have to do here is make the cells competent. We need to treat them with a little salt solution to make them readily able to take it up. And then in addition to that, we have to sort of subject it to some physical conditions that I'm not sure they're too happy with, but we're going to let them chill on ice for a couple of minutes and then we're going to heat shock them for 40, 42 degrees for about a minute and then place them back on ice. So the combination of a little salt, a little cold, a little hot, a little salt, allows the plasmid to be taken in. And then we uh, streak them on uh, petri dishes that we've prepared with different solutions inside of them, and then we check to see if the, or not the bacteria have been transformed. And so once, if we are successful, once the bacteria grows with the green fluorescent protein, it will actually appear uh, as green colonies. It's really neat when you look at this with ultraviolet light. I can't wait to show it to you. Uh, that would mean that we're successful, but the truth is they're producing that protein along with thousands of other proteins that bacteria normally produce. And so the trick is we have to isolate that green fluorescent protein or purify it from all the other bacterial
proteins that they produce. So what we're going to do is scrape up a colony, put it inside of test tube, microcentrifuge tube, and then we're going to spit it in the centrifuge and pellet the cells on the bottom. We're going to add some uh, enzyme that will break down the cell wall and lysis the cells, get out all the protein. And I don't know if you can see this so closely, it's kind of small, but the supernatant will contain the green fluorescent protein and uh, the centrifuge will pellet the cells on the bottom. But just because the protein is in the supernatant doesn't mean that it's purified. We then use some of the properties of the green fluorescent protein and we run it through a hydrophobic chromatography and I'll, I'll get into that in a later conversation. But we basically filter using a, a bead-like matrix, filter through columns uh, that supernatant until we finally purify the green fluorescent protein. It's a really cool technique. And so basically there's two things going down. We're going to transform bacteria to make them glow and then we're going to try to purify that green fluorescent protein or GFP. And so what is transformation? It's basically taking these sort of rubber bands, small rubber bands like embraces these are small rings of DNA called plasmids, and we're going to try to get the bacteria to take them in. And if one does go in, the genes located on that plasmid are, there's a few genes actually, one of them is the gene to produce the green fluorescent protein, and that's what would make the bacteria green. But what's cool is there's another gene that produces ampicillin resistance. And so that's another way in which we could determine whether or not we've actually transformed our bacteria. We, there's two indicators. One is they're green. Another is that they're living on ampicillin plates. If we took E. coli at the start and as a control tried to grow it on an ampicillin plate, and we can do that. If it didn't grow, so in other words there's no growth on an ampicillin plate, we would know that the bacteria were not normally an, antibiotic, antibiotic resistant. But if we transform them and they did gl glow and grow, then we would know that we were successful in our transformation experiment. And so what's the plasmid? It's a circular ring of DNA. It has an origin a replication site. And this BLA gene right here is the gene for ampicillin resistance right over here. And so we believe that these evolved early on in bacteria. And some of them express, express genes for resistance to antibiotics and we can use them as a means of selecting. <clears throat> we can actually put in any gene we want into the plasmid. We just can cut the plasmid using a restriction enzyme and then ligate any gene that we want to into it. And in this case, um, the gene, one of the genes that's been ligated in there already is the green fluorescent protein. And one of the things that we like about the plasmid is that it replicates rather quickly and it, and it replicates on its own. And so it has three main genes of interest. It has the ampicillin resistance gene, it has the green fluorescent protein, and we've also engineered into this pigloplasmid an arabinose opron. In other words, it has a, a promoter, an operator, and structural genes um, all for the, uh, the ability to break down the sugar arbonose. As it turns out, this is a good thing to splice in because if we add to our petri dish the sugar arbonose, arbonose will act as an inducer to get the plasmid, the RNA polymerase in bacteria to read the plasmid more readily and that causes the plasmid to get attention and therefore more green fluorescent protein is produced. I like this picture. You know, we say we use models all the time and diagrams of plasmids and as circles, but this is an actual photograph. Um, it's kind of like a twisted rubber band, but if you were to open it up, it would be a circle. And I think that's pretty neat. So, again, the methods of trans uh, transformation are rather simple. We're going to apply a little salt and in the form of calcium chloride, and then we're going to heat shock them. We think the calcium chloride helps them to be competent. So in other words, um, we're going to take some of the bacterial colonies and scrape them off the plate. We're going to add the pigloplasmid. And what's interesting about adding the pigloplasmid, let me show you this for a second about that. Um, the plasmids are really small, as, as one might think that they are. And so they come 
uh, in a jar from the, the a biotech company. You can order them, Peaklo. And so you can go in with your inoculating loop once you've hydrated it, and it sort of reminds me of like a little bubble that you're going to blow. And you literally put that in a microcentrifuge tube and mix it around with the bacteria. And then on the other one, obviously, you're not going to put any peak low in. And then this is a, showing the, a water bath heat shock. Let me sort of close that down and come back over here. Just wanted to point that out. Might be relevant. And so what we've got going is we want to add the peak low plasmid. So if you're wondering how we're going to do that, we're simply going to stick an inoculating loop into the tube containing the bacteria. We're going to put the bacteria on ice and then we're going to heat shock it by putting it in the water bath and then back on ice again. And then we're going to incubate at 37 degrees uh, with some nutrient broth to sort of let them recover and then ultimately we're going to streak them on petri dishes to see um, how the control worked out. And the control remember is negative peak low and the experiment is positive peak low. So we think, uh, why perform each step of the transformation? We think that the induction salt uh, ionizes or, or um, disassociates into calcium ions, which adheres to the phosphate groups on the backbone of DNA and therefore making it a little bit more neutral. Maybe, maybe this lets the bacteria take in the DNA a little bit more easily, perhaps. Um, we think that the incubation on ice slows the phospholipid bilayer down and therefore makes the cell membrane um, a little bit less mobile perhaps and then the heat shock increases the permeability of the of the cell membrane and then back on cold and so it's not e exactly clear but somehow the induction the cold the hot the cold will allow the plasmid to get inside and then once it's inside you got to give it a little time for it to express the, uh, the two critical proteins, one GFP, but the other critical protein is for ampicillin resistance. So it's got to get busy doing that because if we streak it onto a Petri dish that has ampicillin on it and it doesn't have a chance to produce this resistant protein, then it's going to die. And so one way to speed up the induction of that is by giving it the sugar arbonus. And so that will induce it. And so... The LB is just simply L Luria Bertini broth. And so we, you know, what's that? It's basically kind of like a chicken broth. It's food for the bacteria. It has all your basic goodies over here that you need to grow. And so once you have this basic LB, you can add anything you want. So when we poured the plates, we had some LB plates. We had some LB with ampicillin, and we had some LB, ampicillin, and arabidose sugar. So these are our three kinds of plates. And so the question is, Will it grow and will it glow? And so if I walk you through this, let's see here. Let's say if I had two scenarios, I had one, oops, oops, oops sorry about that. Say I had uh, a situation where we had a test tube containing positive, in other words, peak glow, and then this one's negative. This one does not have the peak glow, but there's E. coli in here. Okay, E. coli in here. Okay, any, any thoughts on this? Like what would happen if we added just ordinary E. coli to a plate that has LB amp? And you're like, I, I don't know. I mean, you can take a guess. Like what happens if there's no colonies? Like nothing grows. You might come to the conclusion that you're like, well, I don't know. I thought it would grow on LB. But apparently it died because ampicillin. So this, this particular bacteria is ampicillin minus. And you're like, well, I don't know, maybe it just doesn't grow at all. Maybe we, when we heat shocked it, we killed all the bacteria, I don't know. Well, you can try that same test tube and add it to LB, and if there's colonies growing, then you know that they didn't die. And you're like, all right, that's great. And you're like, well, what color are they? Well, they might just be white colonies, what, what you would expect E. coli to grow in white colonies. And you're like, okay, okay. What about this? What about would P. glow, in other words, the one that was transformed, would it grow on this? And the answer is yes, it would grow. It would grow on this because this plasmid contains 
ampicillin resistance. But what's interesting here is in this one, when you put this one over here and you grow it on ampicillin, uh, LB, and Arabina sugar, it actually could not only grow, but it'll glow green, especially when you expose it to UV light. Um, and so that means that the, the, the entire plasmid is being expressed and the Arabinose operon is causing the, the amplification of the green fluorescent protein. So it's really cool. There's a lot kind of going on for such a, a simple technique. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you're going to enjoy the experiment itself. So thanks for watching.